why is it that Mount Shasta seems to hold a dark conspiracy like many of the other national parks? Well, today, we're going to look at what appears to be a complete cover-up on Mount Shasta, as well as several strange missing persons all around the mountain. Is there truly a conspiracy going on? Let's find out. This story was submitted to me by Matthew, and Matthew details a strange and disturbing experience he had while up in Mount Shasta. Matthew was with some friends back in 2006 on the Black Butte Trail. It was a nice clear day around the end of September. They were going up the trail to see the view of the valley below, and Matthew's friend began noticing a strange smell as they had hiked up the trail. It smelled like a dead animal that had been rotting for a while. They ignored it, and as they continued up the trail, the smell continued to worsen. Matt began to notice the smell as well now, and it was a putrid, foul odor. As they both went along, the smell continued to get more and more powerful. However, the view was beautiful, but now Matthew was becoming nauseous from how powerful the smell was. Whatever it was had seemed to have been following them the entire time. They tried their best to ignore it and just enjoy the scenery. Matthew took a lot of pictures of the view, and after they had been up there for about a half an hour, the smell had got so bad, they decided it was best to turn back. They had been taking their time. They were not exactly in a hurry. And the smell suddenly became so strong, Matthew could no longer take it. He wanted to get out of there. At this point, he felt like he was going to pass out. As they both went down the trail, Matthew noticed that something was around them. He couldn't say for certain what it was, but he could sense there was a presence there. There was no sound at all, and the odor continued to worsen. Whatever this was had been following them the entire time, and now Matthew was scared. He didn't want to take his eyes off the area around them. He kept thinking that they were going to be ambushed by something. The lack of noise was starting to get to Matthew. You should be able to hear at least the wind, but nothing. It was so quiet that he was even afraid to talk. At points, he could hear a loud ringing in both his ears, and it became so loud he could not ignore it. And he has never had this happen before. On the way back down, he began to feel sick to his stomach and a headache and felt extremely nauseous. Matt felt like he was going to pass out. His friends felt the same way. And then a thunderclap happened, or so it sounded, and they both witnessed this large black object moving over the horizon in the direction and suddenly disappear. Then, within seconds, a bright blinding light had consumed the entire sky, and they saw these strange triangular lights moving in rotation around the sky, heading right toward Mount Shasta. The triangular lights he saw moved in a circular rotation like they were attached to something that wasn't fully visible. He and his friend watched in complete awe at what they were seeing. Yet again, no sounds accompanied the visuals right in front of them. This event maybe lasted no more than 10 seconds before exploding in another flash of bright white light. When the second flash of light stopped, Matthew and his friend vomited their entire breakfast. It was as if they had extreme vertigo all of a sudden. They both felt extremely dizzy for a few moments, as if perhaps having been exposed to radiation. They had no idea how to explain what they had just witnessed and were petrified. They ran down the trail, and as they made their way near the trailhead entrance, both were stopped by somebody who worked for the national parks. Within a few moments of speaking to this individual, they realized he was a park ranger and began accosting Matthew and friend aggressively about what they were doing, where they were going, and what they saw. When he kept mentioning the fact about them seeing something, they weren't exactly sure what he was alluding to. Deep down, they knew he had seen the lights too. In Matt's honest opinion, he believes that the ranger knew what they saw because he began acting very hostile. As the conversation turned from aggressive to very hostile, the ranger made it clear that he was warning them to not talk about what they had seen. If there were any 
accidental slip-ups of information, the ranger warned there would be dire consequences. What terrified Matt was that he kept all the details very vague. To have his demeanor start as neutral and switch to hostile within a couple of moments wasn't a good sign. For years afterward, Matt always figured there was possibly some government or military experimentation going on. It's possible the ranger was trying to clear people out of the area, but why would they be allowing the public to hike that day on that trail if that was the case? To add to this craziness, a couple of Matthew's good friends also hiked Mount Shasta around 2008 and 2009. These are the same friends Matthew had spent a lot of time hiking with in previous years, so he trusts their judgment and opinions. Now, they didn't tell Matt this until a few years after, but they both had experienced some very strange things up on that same mountain. Like Matthew, one friend experienced missing time, but also felt extremely dizzy and nauseous and reported feeling watched as if he was not safe. He spoke to park personnel afterward, and within a minute of the conversation, he too had been pulled aside and threatened to not talk about his experience which Matthew finds very strange. Once Matthew knew about that, he wanted to try and research more, and wouldn't you know it? There are many people having experiences just like this all over Mount Shasta. The weird part is, when talking to park personnel, they refuse to talk about it and threaten hikers and campers alike that there will be consequences if information leaks. What exactly is going on in this mountain, and why does there appear to be a huge conspiracy. After all, Mount Shasta is voted number three in most desired mountains to climb. It is also situated in Northern California and stands at an impressive 14,179 feet, making it the fifth tallest mountain in California and is surrounded by over 2 million acres of forest for those that like day hikes and camping. Shasta is what climbers often refer to as one of 14,000 footers, and is also home to a volcano, which makes climbing it even more treacherous. So besides the conspiracy thing, you have the treachery. Climbers must negotiate overhangs, crevasses, glaciers, icefalls, snow, altitude sickness, and muddy conditions to climb one of the three summit routes. All three routes have their own challenges for climbers, with the south side being the easiest and often the route beginners choose to climb, and the north side being the most challenging due to snow and other hazards. To summit Mount Shasta is no small feat as many have attempted and failed even on the south side route. It was on this route that took the life of avid climber Carl Herbert Lander, a case that would baffle experts for years to come and send search and rescue teams to comb every inch of the mountain looking for this missing California man. And on May 25th, 1999, 69-year-old Carl Lander, a former school board member and Orianda, California resident, made plans to climb Mount Shasta with two friends, Barry Gilmore and Milton Gaines. The three men met up at the mountain and gathered their equipment, each of them an experienced climber and knew the mountain very well. The south side of Shasta, known as Avalanche Gulch, was the route the men chose to take as it was the least dangerous and quickest trail. On average, Avalanche Gulch takes between two to three days, if snow and other weather conditions are favorable. Even in late May, the temperatures on Mount Shasta can be in the 70s for high and as low as the upper 30s for the low. On May 25th, 99, the high was 77 Fahrenheit and 46 for the low. This is warmer than average. The three men met at a local running club and were fit enough to make the strenuous hike. Even though the south face of Shasta is the easiest route, it's still physically demanding. The day began pleasant and the men were having fun talking about family and future hiking plans. Lander had set a goal for himself to hike the tallest peaks in California and have completed that goal by the end of 99. As the three made their way to the first stopping point called 5050 Plateau, it was stated that Lander said he didn't feel well, but never elaborated on why. Now that night, 
The other men made their camp. Carl Lander, still not feeling well, set out at dusk up towards Shasta Peak, telling his friends that he wanted to get a head start for the next stage of the climb. When the hikers returned the next day, Lander was nowhere to be found. When the two friends did not catch up to him, they reported him as missing. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department responded immediately, scrambling a heli ambulance to search in the air while ground crews covered the entire area of Avalanche Gulch. Also joining the search was the California Highway Patrol, the National Guard, the United States Forest Service, as well as volunteers on skis and foot. The search area has no vegetation that could obscure a body nor crevasses for someone to fall in. Lake Helen was also checked thoroughly. No clues were found. As days then turned into weeks, there was no sign of Carl Lander. Carl Lander was in good physical health when he went missing. He was a long distance runner and avid mountain climber. It was reported that when he left camp at 5050 Plateau, Lander had a backpack with some water and food. Carl Lander is described as a 69 year old male with brown hair, blue eyes, and was wearing two to three layers of clothing, black ski pants, a rust colored jacket, and boots with crampons. At the time of his disappearance, he was 5'9, 150 pounds, and in good physical health. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office is handling the missing person's case for Lander. If you or someone you know has any information or have seen Carl Lander on May 25th, 99, or anything pertaining to the case, you are urged to contact the County Sheriff's Office. On December 15th, 2002, 34-year-old Angie Fuller was with her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Thomas O'Connell, when they had an argument over mud tract inside his truck. Fulmer stormed away into the Shasta Trinity National Forest, never to be seen again. Authorities from the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office were contacted eight hours later by the boyfriend when he couldn't find Fulmer. In an interview, O'Connell told sheriff's deputies that after Fulmer stormed away from the truck, she walked towards the forest where he'd heard a car door slam and an engine fading away. As he cleaned out his truck, waiting for her to return, at the time of her disappearance, the unnamed boyfriend was not a person of interest. The Siskiyou Sheriff's Office immediately initiated search and rescue efforts, believing Fulmer had become lost in the woods, but because of inclement weather, had to postpone them. There were no new leads in the case for over a year, but in August of 2003, an unnamed man walking his dog in Mount Shasta Trinity National Forest near the North Shore Road when he stumbled upon human bones. Police descended on the area, collecting the fragments to have tested, as they believed they belonged to one of the three missing women, but were most likely those of Angela Fulmer. The fragments were too small to be successfully tested, and the case went cold. Authorities believe Angela Fulmer's disappearance was suspicious in nature, and because she made no effort to contact any of her five daughters, nor had her bank or credit cards been accessed. The last person known to have seen Fulmer alive was her boyfriend at the time, who was not a suspect. Angela Marie Fulmer was described as 34 years old with shoulder-length brown hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a black sweater, blue jeans, black boots, and was last seen walking into the forest toward the Twin Pines area. Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office has found bone fragments that could be Angela Fulmer. If you or anyone you know has information pertaining to the case, you are also asked to contact the county sheriff's office. On March 1st, 2014, 24-year-old Grace Ellen Sappitz had a brief encounter with a law enforcement at a campsite off State Route 96. This was the last time she was ever seen. The officer was making random contact with campers in the area to check on them when he came across Sappitz who seemed in good health and in no need of assistance. The next morning when the deputy returned, Sabitz was not at the campsite. Later, the deputy was making his way along Klamath River when he found Sabitz's blue 1989 Toyota Corolla sitting on the side of the road. She was nowhere to be seen. As he checked the scene, he recalled that particular car from his visit the day before with Grace. As he searched the area, Footprints were found leading to the river, 
but no return tracks could be seen. The deputy made a report and added that there was unspecified evidence that indicated she, Grace Sabbats, was injured or in danger, but did not elaborate on what led him to believe that, nor specified what other clues and evidence was found at the scene. On Saturday, March 1st, 2014, a search of Klamath River and the Skian River access area only deepened the mystery as to what happened to Sabbats as search and rescue teams, the California Highway Patrol helicopter, and volunteers joined the search but found nothing to indicate where she could have gone. The area where Grace Sabbats went missing is very rural and about eight miles from Interstate 5 in Northern California right where her blue Toyota Corolla was also found without any clues as to where she could have disappeared to. The Ski and River Access Area on the Klamath River provides river access and is popular for camping. The search lasted for at least six days as authorities focused on the area where Sabbath's car and footprints were found, but without success. Sabbath's was never seen nor heard from again. The deputy stated that this type of disappearance is fairly uncommon. Allison Janini, a spokesperson for the California Highway Patrol, stated in an interview that we don't know if she was just staying there or what she was doing. Also adding that the department was unwilling to release any info as to why the deputy felt Sabbats was injured or in danger, saying, we're just not releasing that at this time. The disappearance of Grace Ellen Sabbats remains a mystery to this day. There have been no updates in the case by authorities since March 4th, 2014, when the sheriff of Siskiyou County Sheriff addressed the public in an interview about search efforts stating this. We concentrated our search and rescue efforts in the river and downstream several miles in an attempt to find Miss Sabbats. We deployed a departmental boat and camera in the river area where she was last seen. We have also deployed foot and mobile patrols at numerous river access points in the area. Search teams have encountered rugged terrain, adverse weather, and other challenges, but we are doing all we can to find Miss Sabbats. The search was called off on Friday, March 8, 2014, having found no other clues as to her sudden disappearance. She is described as 24-year-old white female that stands about 5'3", 130 pounds. She has blue eyes and blonde hair, who was last seen by a deputy at the Skian River Access Area on Klamath River. She was driving a 1989 blue Toyota Corolla at the time she was last seen, which was found along with footprints that led to the river's edge off of Highway 96. At the time of her disappearance, Sabbats resided in Portland, Oregon, but was originally from the Sacramento area of California. If you or anyone you know has any information on this case, please contact the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department. On June 4th, 1997, 15-year-old cheerleader and aspiring model Hannah Zakayini left her ex-boyfriend's home and was last seen walking towards her home in McLeod, California, near Mount Shasta. Hannah's ex-boyfriend lived near Zakayini, about a block away, and the two had visited earlier in the day when they apparently broke up as the boyfriend was moving to Nevada with his family. Zakayini was initially thought to be a runaway as her parents had recently divorced, and now with the breakup of her relationship, it was thought she may have needed some time to herself. However, authorities found her belongings, including her purse and money at her home, during a search after she was reported missing. Hannah Zakayini had strong ties to her community as she was a high school student and played bass guitar in a band as well as being a cheerleader. She had also found out her band would be playing at the Wairika Speedway and by all appearances was very excited about this news. As she walked home, she ran into a neighbor that would later be questioned in Zakayini's disappearance, Mr. Ed Heinlein Sr., his wife and their son, Henline Jr., lived in the neighborhood and were family friends of Zakayini family. Hannah stopped to talk with Henline Sr. and was seen walking towards his house, as reported to authorities. She was never seen again. In a strange twist, though, another woman named Karen Miro was also reported missing four months earlier and was the girlfriend of Henline Jr. at the end of June of 1997. 
the Siskiyou Sheriff's Department asked the FBI to aid in the disappearance of Hannah Zakiyini as the case wasn't moving forward. As the FBI took over the case, they started with the headlines, questioning them about the night Ed Sr. was seen talking to Hannah before she went missing. The headlines agreed to a search of their home, although it is unknown what the authorities found. However, they did note that the family owned a boat that was burned shortly after Zakiyini's disappearance and that the headlines and borrowed the Zakiyini's van the same day their daughter went missing, giving the reason that their car was broken down and they needed to run some errands. When the Zakiyini's van was returned later that night, it had been thoroughly cleaned, which was strange because that family wasn't known to be very clean people. The FBI was taking note of these clues as the investigation entered in 1998, and in April of that year would serve an arrest warrant for the headlines for welfare fraud because they were still collecting disability checks for the still missing girlfriend of Hanline Jr. The headlines pleaded guilty to perjury and agreed to reimburse the government over $1,800 in benefits they collected while Karen Marrow had been missing. They were also placed on three years of probation. In May of 1998, two rings of Karens that had purportedly been pawned in Mount Shasta were found by her parents and retrieved. There were no records of who had sold the rings to the store and no surveillance. In June, two more warrants were served at the Henlein's home and cadaver dogs were brought in to search for remains. At the time of her disappearance, Hannah Zakiyini was described as a Caucasian female, 15 years of age, about 5'5", 120 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a silver band ring, black and green checkered shirt, black Vans canvas shoes, and blue jeans. Zakiyini's shirt had distinctive daisy buttons she wore that day. On February 15th, 1997, 27-year-old Karen Elizabeth Marrow went missing from McLeod, California. Marrow, a liver transplant recipient with strong ties to the community. At the time of her disappearance, Marrow was separated from her husband and was living with the Henlines while dating their son, Ed Henline Jr. Having not heard from her daughter in several days, Alice Netchel went to the local PD to report her daughter missing. Shasta County Sheriff's Department was hesitant to take a missing persons report on Merrill because she was an adult and had an active warrant. Police told the concerned mother that the police thought Merrill may be hiding out somewhere due to the warrant for her arrest. Months passed without any word from Karen, causing more concern from her friends and family because the anti-rejection medication Merrill left behind when she was last seen. Anti-rejection drugs are designed to aid in a smooth transition of organs from donor to recipient, so the recipient's body doesn't reject the new organ. Merrill took this medication daily, and upon checking with prescribing doctor, learned that the prescription hadn't been filled in over three months. Alarmed at this news, Marrow's parents returned to the sheriff's department where they agreed to file a missing persons report. Precious time had been lost at this point as this was well into October of 97. This is when Alice Netchel learned about the disappearance of Hannah and the connection to the headlines of whom was the last people to have seen both missing women. Despite several searches for the women in the coming months, both cases went cold until June of 98. The Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department would open a case against Debbie and Ed Headline Sr. for welfare fraud. The Zakiyini and Merrow cases would again go cold and remain that way for 14 years until a new tip and testimony led to the arrest of Ed Headline Sr. for the murder of Hannah Zakiyini in November of 2012. His son Ed was subsequently arrested for accessory and conspiracy a few days later, also connected to the homicide. The townsfolk were relieved there was movement in the case, but that was short-lived. In May of 2013, Siskiyou County District Attorney Kirk Andrus dropped all charges against the two men, citing a lack of evidence, or a body, as they wanted the remains found before prosecuting the case. This was seen as a major setback by investigators, especially Detective Sergeant James Randall, who has since become the undersheriff of Siskiyou County, and has worked the case from the beginning. Randall is certain the cases are connected. 
2022 marks 22 years that the case of Hannah Zakiyini and Karen Mara's cases have been investigated without any convictions. However, in an interview with News 10 in Siskiyou County, Oregon, Detective Sergeant Randall, now undersheriff of Siskiyou County, had this to say. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. They probably believe they've gotten away with this. He went on to say that, These are not closed investigations. We're not going to stop. We will get closure to this. Meanwhile, the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Department stated that all three members of the Henline family have been questioned on multiple occasions and was mostly uncooperative and unwilling to talk. Randall ended the interview with this statement. Ed Headline Sr. is at the center of all of this. I don't think it's a secret for the Sheriff's Department or a secret of the community of McLeod. Both cases are still active, and the Siskiyou Sheriff's Department is asking anyone with any information to please come forward. There is a $2,000 reward that could be increased even more. More importantly, what do you think? Is the first story a case of a mass conspiracy or hallucinations? Is there truly a connection to all of these missing person cases, or are they all isolated? I'll let you be the judge. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and slap that like and subscribe button for more content just like this one. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode.